part of the reason is that he didn't find economics useful to suggest policies for the elevation of the Dalit. He depends more on sociology, he depends more on anthropology, he depends more on law, and he depends more on political science. And you can see from his presentation, which I will try to explain. So therefore, when we try to study the economic vision of economic development vision of Dr. Ambedkar, one has to be very careful, one has to really fish out, one has to be really, really writing. The most of the writing to which Prof. Nanjali has referred us are before 1925. His PhD thesis, uh, 2016, he brought out in 2013, 2023. In the same year, he put his problem of the rupees and his two MSc and MA theses. These are the thesis, these are the books which deals with the contemporary problem of, of that time. There are messages for economic development today. Some of the messages are very important on public, uh, on how should be the revenue policy, expenditure policy, exchange policy. Uh, but nevertheless, they have a historical uh, limitation. One of the outcome of his writing of his PhD book was, of course, the establishment of Reserve Bank. He was the one who suggested that there should be a uh, a central bank, bank of England. But beyond that, we, uh, for the economic development, we have to look for his writing and we have to read it. Uh, fish also, of course, which are very important. I think if Dr. Ambedkar is relevant uh, on a number of other issues, in my view, he is also equally relevant on the issue of, or on the question of vision of economic development. Therefore, uh, drawing from his writing, I will try to present his vision of economic development and his something evident in the present politics. It's very, very important. But before I do that, let us first put the things in the context. What is economic development? And what was the thought of Dr. Wallace Ambedkar of the concept of economic development? Now, the concept of economic development itself has gone into a rapid change over a period of time. But within five minutes, I will try to uh, explain because it is in this context that we can examine what are the suggestions of the problem, how good are those suggestions, and what are the lessons today. Uh, uh, we have to get out of the habit of uh, repeating Dr. Wallace Ahmedkar's view, but not drawing conclusion from me. his writing to the present situation. There are a lot of many messages uh, on many other issues, but also on the question of economic development. Now, economic development in economics is uh, defined, or is, is in basically constitute uh, in different areas, I think broadly speaking, but I don't have time to go into the detail. Economic development essentially means that the, that the people should be free from hunger, that people should have access to education, that People should not suffer from need help. In general, economic development essentially means that there should be a well-being. People should be properly fed, provide proper education, proper health, civic amenities, so that their standard of living is uh, good. It is the well-being of the people that really indicated by the uh, concept of economic development. Now, it was. Uh, also measure, how do you measure economic development? It's very important to understand. In the beginning, in the early, early 50s, the economic development is generally measured by income. And if the income of the country is high, the country will be economically advanced. But then somebody had the, uh, one more feature that the income may be high, the population may be equally high. So per person income may be very low. So let us take per capita income as an indicator of economic development of the country. So we generally take per capita income of different countries and place those countries uh, in advanced category whose per capita income is very high. Now, per capita income is essential indicator of measuring economic development, certainly. <coughs> but then people find out that uh, in the 80s, in Latin America, there were several countries where per capita income was high, and yet it coincided with the high poverty. Why did the economists began to take per capita income because they thought 
If the income of a person is high, it will translate into a access to food, it will translate uh, into an access to good education or good health. So what you require is just to increase the income and measure the per capita income at the country level. But then the paradox was found out that in many Brazilian countries, in many countries, the per capita income was uh, high, but, but it, it coincided with a very high proportion of the population being poor which means that large portion of the increased income was confined to a small section of population and large section of the population did not have income. Therefore, poverty exists, illiteracy exists, ill health exists, malnutrition exists. Therefore, the economists began to challenge the per capita income as a criteria to measure the economic development and added supplementary criteria that income is important, but the, it should result into some of the indicators of human development. Therefore, we should take longevity, life expectancy. If you have a good food to eat for a longer period of time, if you can take up care of your health, your life expectancy will go. So life expectancy is a dominant indicator of human health. And then education. So as some of the economists are familiar, they, they switch over from, not switch over, but supplementary income criteria, per capita income criteria with life expectancy, with education and estimate what is for human development. <coughs> now every country and every state is developing human development. The point is that the economic development has to be now measured by the ultimate outcome indicators of income, health, education, malnutrition. And uh, I had developed that index uh, for the social group, so you have had also uh, the discrimination index if possible. Now this is the background of the economic uh, uh, the meaning of the economic development. Now, this will help us to understand what Dr. Ambedkar has said about the notion of economic development. Now, when we talk of notion of economic development, there are two points we have to One, Dr. Ambedkar defined what is economic development, uh, but also define the ways of bringing the faster economic development. In fact, you find, if you look at the entire writing of Dr. Ambedkar on economics and otherwise, he analyzed the problem, find out the causes and provide the solution. So I think when we discuss the Dr. Ambedkar's views on economic development, we have to understand what he has to say about the causes of the backwardness and the solution. Now, before going into data detail, because we don't have a time, uh, I will state a little what is his concept of economic development. The concept of economic development of, of Dr. Ambedkar is, uh, which is after 30, 40, 50 years, people began to accept. So Dr. Ambedkar was way ahead of time in terms of defining economic development. He defined economic development that it is, it is a development we need that yes, income should grow, but income of the poor, income of all the population. This attaching equity and distribution to the growth of income was a major uh, thinking of his. In the world where, in the neoclassical economies, the economic development was only measured by increase in the per capita. That was only income distribution among the classes, among the society was not the criteria. It was automatically assumed that as income increases, it, it automatically trickled out to the poor. That was the trickle down uh, uh, hypothesis by Kuznets. It was Kuznets who let down this hypothesis that let there be a growth. This paradigm is also there today. Let there be a growth in the income, allow the income to grow, and then the, that income will naturally pass on to the poor through employment and through many other mechanisms. So there was no discussion at that time, because they did not discuss about distribution of income. He said, because next, with the based on the study of the 125 countries, found that as income grows, inequality increases. Poverty doesn't get it. But he discovered that after some time, income begins to trickle down to the poor. Poverty also declined, inequality also declined. So he said, don't worry. The growth will take care of poverty automatically. There is no need of state intervention. 
Now this hypothesis of Kuznets was blown into pieces later on when they discovered that in Atlantic, in Latin American country, income grew, but poverty also was accompanied by meeting. But the Kuznets uh, hypothesis has been completely wiped out in my view by Pekin, who brought out the book, Capital, uh, the 21st century, where he got just the opposite result than, than what Kuznets got. I don't want to go into that, but what we have to uh, fo focus is on Ahmed. Dr. Ambedkar, because he, as back as 1980, the article to which uh, he talked about the development meeting, or I would put it equitable development. In fact, if you focus equity so much uh, that we can call his concept of development as equitable development. Now, let us go and discuss very briefly uh, uh, what are his views on this. Now, if, if his concept of economic development is development with equity, development with income distribution in favor of poor, then there are two concepts and we have to study his view. One is the nature of inequality in the process of economic growth. Uh, that he has spent quite a lot of time. And then second part of it, that how do you promote economic development? And I'll come to that later. But he focuses almost of his entire life on the question of inequality in this society. And, and came with the analysis, the nature of inequality in India and the causes of inequality. Now, look at him, his academic chart. As a student at the age of 20, perhaps, 22, in London, in Colombia, he wrote a paper, last in India. At the age of 20, he developed a theory. Uh, and such an outstanding theory, how caste originated, all that. I am not going into that. When he went to England, and Burton Russell published a uh, book, Reconstruction of Society, he made a new book, and published in a philosophical journal, How to Reconstruct Society. Again, at the age of 24. Up down, in 1936, he write an annihilation of caste. So try to understand the caste issue. Immensely preoccupied caste inequality and dealing with the question of caste. He did not work on capitalism. He didn't study of capitalism, feudalism, capitalism, uh, the inequality associated with capitalism or feudalism. They went, you know, no. you don't find much on the working of capital, capitalist system in India but on caste caste. Then during the similar period, what you discover is now the Maharashtra government has published the book and if you pick up volume number three, volume number five, you can see a number of cases. Philosophy of Hinduism, essential feature of Hindu social order, unique feature of Hindu social order, and volume five uses many, many essays on untouchability. And there are other essays, and all essays deals with the social, economic, cultural inequality. No other person was offset, I would say, so great and exposed the, exposed the inequality associated with class system and intentionally uh, in India. But then, what we have to understand is that beside the social and cultural and religious aspect that we, there are economic aspects. This conference is an economic issue. What he has to say about the economics of class system, and that's very, very important. In all his, this writing, this group of writing that I have indicated, what you discover is, uh, very briefly I will submit, that he defined class system. I don't think any other economic, any other sociologists have come closer to understand the caste. There are several theories of caste, but nobody can be Dr. Amin. I have read all of them to verify, and they fail to get hold of the real meaning of the caste system, in which includes including uh, the hierarchy of caste, uh, the French anthropology. 